Tonight, our 18th study here in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll pick up in verse 25 here in Matthew 6. And probably one of the greatest hurdles that we face as Christians. It's up there in that range of things like temptation to sin. self-reliance but the temptation to worry and remember the Lord is is again with a crowd of people to whom he's speaking you know in a very pastoral way he, he's basically ministering with a group of close friends and the crowd that's gathered around is kind of getting to listen in on this and so as Jesus begins to, to speak to this next subject, you have to remember that what he previously spoke about was those things that we would call our wants or luxuries. And he reminded us that we have to be careful where we store up treasure because storing up treasure is an indication of where our heart's at. Where we store that treasure is a solid indicator of where our hearts are at. And so now he moves on to what you and I would really have been thinking at the time. Okay, well, okay, I get that. I, I know I'm not supposed to be overly concerned with luxuries and, you know, living the good life and all those kind of things. But what about the things I really need? What about the, the basic necessities uh, of our life, our existence? while we're here on this earth. As human beings, as we said a couple of weeks ago, we are fairly naturally thing-oriented. We have a tendency when we can grasp, grasp something and hang on to it, uh, it brings us a measure sometimes of comfort. It can also bring us a measure of reliance. And so the Lord is now going to speak into this area of our life that I think just plagues uh, not just our world, but even plagues the church. And so as we dig in here to verse 25 in Matthew 6, don't worry. A little bit of a lesson from the birds. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you again for just the opportunity to gather together in your house. And Lord, as we've had a rich day already in the morning, Lord, we come back tonight really for kind of some dessert. Some time for you to just speak to us, uh, a select group that have gathered together tonight that really want a little more than we've already gotten this morning. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us an extra helping and that that helping would be full. And so bless us as we study. We ask these things in the amazing, the wonderful name, a name that is above every name, a name that is salvation to those of us who believe. In the name of Jesus, amen. Verse 25, and let's read this whole passage all the way down to verse 34. And therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. And that seems almost kind of inconsistent with reality, doesn't it? Don't worry about, what do you mean don't worry about your life? What's the Lord Jesus saying? So that we get it, he goes into great detail. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? And look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? For which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? How many of you will grow 18 inches by by worrying, the distance between the tip of your forefinger and your elbow. How, how many of you will actually get taller by worrying? He begins to break it down. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Read it as the real question is, why is it that we worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even 
Solomon, the, the incredible Solomon, perhaps the richest person that's ever walked the face of the earth, multiplying out his fortune into our modern day and time, uh, he would have made Bill Gates seem as though he was a pauper. Warren Buffett would have gone to Solomon for a loan. Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And here's the issue. O oh, you of little faith. You see, in the central part of our thoughts and our minds, you can't miss what the Lord's saying. He's really telling us it's sin to worry. And he says the real problem is a lack of faith. And therefore, do not worry. <laughs> saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek Unbelievers seek, people who don't know God seek, it is their modus operandi, it's what they live for, it's how their life is actually framed on most days. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, and notice that the truth of the matter is God does acknowledge that we need to eat, we need to drink, and we need to be clothed. It doesn't escape God. God's not blind to that fact. He doesn't see that and go, oh well, I don't care. They can just fend for themselves. God not only knows that you need all these things, but then he says how to achieve what we all seek. And that's a worry-free existence. Seek first the kingdom of God. Notice it doesn't say go make sure that you have your one-week plan, your one-month plan, your one-year plan, your five-year plan. It says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. It says, look, you have to get the first thing right. If you're someone who names the name of the Lord, then worry to us is a lack of faith in God. And therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Not might, will. Tomorrow, absolutely, there will be things that will come up in your life that are needs. It's going to be real. It will happen. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. For sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And boy, are we thing-oriented. I went over, kind of, and Austin, we're over at the, the new extension to the Del Amo Mall and wandering around. Man, are we stuff-oriented. I, 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 frankly, I'm like, where would anyone put all of these things? I'm sitting here watching people with bags and bags and bags and bags and bags and bags of shoes and clothes and every manner of thing. There was some guy flying a some type of a drone around the mall, you know. I'm like, it's like oh, it's kind of cool, but I'm not sure I qualify that as a need. And so the Lord begins to speak to these things. And you know a psychotic person knows that two and two makes five and is perfectly happy about it, right? Yep, it's five. But it's really a neurotic person that thinks two and two makes four, but still terribly worried about it. So which one are you? Are you psychotic or are you neurotic? Or, or you really trust the Lord? You see, there are times when I think we get anxious about all manner of things. We become worry. And, and it, that anxiety is, is unnatural to us as God's kids. That's why in Christians it does so much damage. It does damage to everyone. 
But for we who say, you know, Jesus is Lord, he is my Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider. I rest and I trust. And then we go about our lives worrying exactly the way people without the Lord worry. I think in some ways we actually have it a little worse. A person who pursues money thinks that riches is going to solve all the problems. You know, it's a lot of people. But in reality, riches create more problems. That's actually what they do. Anybody who tells you differently either hasn't been around very long or has never had riches themselves. Riches, definitely, I can tell you this categorically, riches create problems. They create tons of work. There is an awful lot to maintain riches. People think about it. You have to do all kinds of adjustments to your living to to keep up with those things which we would call riches. And then that material worth, in essence, starts to get a life of its own. Gives us a danger, a very false sense of security, quite frankly. And ultimately, it can often end in tragedy. I, I can't even tell you how many people that I personally know that have done virtually nothing wrong in their life at some point in time have been materially prosperous, began to trust in those riches, and through no action of their own, simple circumstances in life, they've ended up without all of those riches. And for those who trusted in those riches, their lives come unhinged. And so Jesus said, be careful. If you're depending on money, money will fail. If you're depending on money, money can ultimately become your God. And we may dignify worry by calling it all manner of things. We we call it burdens. We call it a cross to bear. We call it all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, Worry is a lack of faith that God's going to take us to where we need to be. Do for us what he says he will do. The last time, our last study here in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus focused in on those things that we'd call luxury. But when you really look at this, you see rich people are tempted to trust in their possessions. But poor people have a problem too because they're tempted to doubt God's provision. Rich people may be tempted to become self-satisfied and that false security that comes from their riches takes over and the poor person is tempted to worry and fear about the false insecurity of their poverty. And so the problem is the same, just opposite sides of the same coin. And so Jesus says, don't worry. And he gives us a fourfold way to understand this. I want to share something with you about 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus teaches in his time in ministry recorded for us in the gospel. About 16 of the 38 deal with money. That's about 46%. Money or possessions. About one out of ten verses in the entire New Testament deals with either money or possessions or something that could be equated to those things, the subject of the things that are possessed by a human being. Scripture itself offices or offers us around 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 on faith, but over 2,000 on money and possessions. It's an important topic for us. Because it can become your God very quickly. And before you know it, you're trusting in Chase Bank. Or you're trusting in in some monetary instrument. And you're no longer trusting God for what only God can do in the first place. And so, when we think about these things, Jesus gives a simple command. He says, do not be anxious or do not worry. He, he, he's basically saying, stop it. Don't do it. If you're doing it now, quit doing it. If you're thinking about it, don't even think about it. He gives it as an objective command. He says, here's the problem. The problem is worry and don't do that. Four things that you can take away from this passage tonight. 
The first of which is that worry shows a lack of faith because of who God is. Think about who's speaking these things. It shows a lack of faith because of who God actually is. And Jesus says, therefore I say to you, or for this reason is another way to look at it, it refers back to the previous verse. And, and God's supposed to be the believer's only master. Amen? He's our master. Money's not our master. Homes aren't our master. Government's not even actually our master. Though at times we feel like that may be, and we need to be under the subjection of those authorities that have been placed over us, but they're not actually our master. Our master is God. And, and so we have to leave God, God. And very often we don't leave God, God. We, we replace God with something or someone else. And so he's saying, look, as your master, I don't want you to ever be tempted to be anxious over the things that you need. And to prove that to us, he says, look, I'm going to talk to you first about your life, your suke. Your, your life, the very substance of who you are, your physical being. And that also, in that sense, in the original language, would have incorporated your physical being, your mental being, your emotional being, and your spiritual being. All of you. And think about how much time that you in your own life have occupied yourself with worry and it's destroyed your physical being, your mental being, your emotional being, and even your physical being. That's why Jesus said don't do it. Because worry literally can kill you. Worry is that sin of distrusting the provinces, the providence, the promises of God. Actually, in our English, it, it comes from a, a, a Germanic root. When you translate from the original language, from the Greek text into English, it actually went through Latin and German, and it comes from a word in German that means to strangle or to choke out. Worry strangles and chokes out faith. That's what it does. When you wander around distrusting God, and before you know it, everything in your life becomes gauged by the amount of worry that you put into thinking about things with an inordinate fear that God is not going to take care of you. And we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it at times. There are days when I have to be checked, and matter of fact, one of the glories of, of, of my bride is that she will remind me, look, God's still got this under control. No, he doesn't. No, every once in a while, pastors do it. Anybody, the rest of the pastors here on staff will tell you the same thing. Worry can creep in, and when it does, it's because you're not trusting God. It begins to strangle begins to choke out the good things in your life. And again, it's not talking about reasonable, reasonable decision-making processes. In other words, you have two things, and they both have a positive and a negative, and there's something to be you know, discerned in, in that decision. It's not talking about decision-making. It's talking about that inordinate fear that no matter what you do, somehow God just fell off the throne. There's no possible way that the Lord could have this under control. And I'll share with you, there's so little substance. When you think about, think in your own life, and I want to really challenge you, think in your own life of something that you have spent time worrying about. And, and I pray that that's not something that's going on currently, but think back a little further to something that you worried about, and you worried yourself sick, and it never came to pass. Amen? I don't know if you've had things. I've had lots of things that I've concerned myself with. I'm just like, well, you know, this could happen and that could happen. And, you know, what about this? And if, you know, you just run through all of the various component parts of every eventuality and every possibility that could ever occur with regard to that situation, before you know it, you are absolutely sick to your stomach. And then you realize there was nothing that you did in your worrying that you could have 
actually accomplished anything with regard to that situation. There, there was nothing that your worrying could have ever done to make that situation, maybe even any different, much less actually resolve it. And yet now you're worried, in essence, to death. It's much like fog. You know, when we lived in, in running springs, we used to call it foggy springs for a reason, because part of the year rim fog settles in, and we get fog here in the South Bay that's, that's pretty thick, but up there it's a whole different level. I've been in fog so thick that you cannot see the end of the hood of your own car. That's thick fog. That's the kind of fog we've had times coming home from basketball games and we, I was coaching and the boys would be in the, the team, you know, team vehicle and we're driving on the rim and literally I would sit on the windowsill of my own car and steer while I'm looking at the lines on the road and ask the boys, have we gone off the cliff yet? <laughs> Which the drop should tell you that you went off the cliff, but just thought I'd ask. Strange thing about fog. If you break down water into its smallest molecular component, single water molecules, and you take one cup of water, a single cup, it's enough to cover seven city blocks 100 feet deep to where you can barely see the hand in front of your face. There's no substance to it. It's just a little bit of water. But because of you now having to look through that little bit of water, it appears like it's this horrific event that's occurred when in fact it's just simply a little bit of water that's been vaporized. That's the way worry works in your life. There's a little bit of truth to the general concern that you have, but you take it to such an extreme, it's so blown into its finest component parts that now it seems unbelievably huge. So much so that maybe God can no longer take care of it. It becomes like that fog to you. There's no substance to it, but it looks very formidable. Every believer, all of us ought to be able to say, as, as Paul will go on to tell us in our study in Philippians, I, I've learned in whatever circumstances I'm in to be content in all things. There are going to be times of plenty and there's going to be times of want in every single person's life. And we need to learn how to be content. And in the same thought, there are really three things that you can kind of glean from this. God owns everything, doesn't he? Does it make any sense if he owns everything and you're his kids that he would withhold from you anything that isn't for your good? If he withholds something from you, it's for your good. If he gives something to you, it's for your good. In other words, all that God does is good, it is right, he is true, and he is loving. So if you need it, you're going to get it. And if you don't need it, he may take it from you because you shouldn't have it. You see, God owns everything. Psalm 24 is clear on that issue. The earth and the fullness of it. The world, all that dwell on it. Why then do we worry about things that really belong to the Lord? They actually were never ours to begin with. A second thing in this category is that we ought to be content because God actually controls everything as well. Is he sovereign or is he not sovereign? If he's sovereign, then he controls everything. Now, he may allow things that we don't like, he, he may uh, allow things in this world that we would look at, I don't know how he would want to use that, but he does because he's God. And so we need to see it from that perspective. God owns everything, God controls everything. And the third thing, God then will provide everything that we need. So when you think through this whole concept, look, worrying is sin. Because it literally calls into question who God is. God is good. And he knows what you need. He knows what I need. 
We pamper our bodies, we decorate our bodies, we eat things, we put things on, and we put way too much emphasis on those things. And before you know it, we begin to doubt a good God because somebody else has something we don't have. Somebody else is able to eat something that we haven't eaten yet. God is still good. We do live in mortal bodies, and God knows exactly what we need to do. A second thing, worry shows a complete lack of trust in our Father's love for us. Worry shows a complete lack of trust in our Father's love for us. It says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather, and yet your Father feeds them. Now think about it. Think about what's being said. Why would Jesus say, aren't you more important than sparrows? Aren't you more important than birds? You've been made in God's very image. He's adopted you actually into his family. He doesn't do that with birds. He doesn't have that same care, that same concern that he has for you, for the birds of the air. He takes care of them, however, and if he loves you because you've been made in his image then how can you mistrust his love? You're not going to see like a protest going down the middle of Vermont with a bunch of sparrows. More seed on Tuesday, you know, a bunch of little tiny signs. You're not going to see that. Why? Because Father God takes care of his creation He also is going to take care of his kids. And yet we worry about things like food. And yet all of the world's animals, isn't it interesting that, you know, when we don't mess it up, this planet's in pretty solid balance. You know, you you really don't see animals dying off from starvation. You don't see animals without enough drink. When man gets in the way and fouls things up, those things have a tendency to happen, but not in God's creation, the way he made the world. And so God takes care of them. And he loves us. He cares for his creation. He gives providential care, but he loves you. He loves me. And so why do we worry? No bird is created in the image of God. No bird was ever promised air, ship, to Christ? Think about it. As majestic as the bald eagle is, there are no saved bald eagles. Am I going to be wandering around? Yes, I'm, you know, going to heaven. They're part of the creation. No bird has a place prepared. There's no mansion prepared in heaven for birds. I'm not saying there might not be birds in heaven. It's just that the Lord doesn't find it necessary to pass along salvation to his creation uh, that, that are the animal world. He just simply takes care of them. But he's actually taken the care to send Jesus to die for us. So he loves us. We worry about our longevity. That's crazy. I was reading a little article. It was written originally by Dr. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic. And he he was writing about the findings of a study that they had undertaken at the Mayo Clinic with regard to worry and the associated stress that comes from it. And it said there, and I'm quoting, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. I've never met a single man nor have known a man to ever die of overwork, but I have known men who've died of worry. That's crazy. Talk to cardiologists, they'll tell you the same thing. Mind has told me that. I came back from a trip to Brazil. Cardiologist is saying, well, do you have life insurance? I said, yes. He says, good, you might need it. He has stopped stressing over stuff. And I said, what? He says, yes, you're totally stressed out. Look at your blood pressure. I said, I'm not stressed, I'm a pastor. He says, you're stressed. You're worrying about everything. 
But I'm not worrying about everything. You're making me worry about everything. <laughs> worry can do that. A worry won't make you live longer, but it might just shorten your life. God's perspective, he's got a time that you're going to go. But worry can absolutely take its toll on you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And worrying about clothing, need we even address that issue? My goodness. We are a nation that is obsessed with clothing. It's crazy. The, the amount of money that we spend, we go through our closets, and I'm not picking on anybody. I, I guarantee you there's a few too many garments in the Gill household. And some of it's I'm just too cheap to throw them away. Need to give them to somebody, do something with them. No, I might wear that. I mean, it's only been 40 years. You know what I'm saying. But we do. We obsess about these things. A strange thing, when we lived in, in Austria, I learned something about European culture. Uh, in Europe, they, don't, they think we are nuts. When they hear the phrase, walk in closet, that's called a bedroom in Europe. They can't even imagine anybody owning a closet big enough to walk in. It seems senseless to them. Why? Because they accessorize. They buy one nice jacket, a couple of pairs of pants, a couple of pairs of shoes. They mix and match. And they don't really care what you think in a general sense. You see, but with us, it's like, well, that's not pink. That's kind of a mauvish kind of, you know, sort of a mellow plum color. And we, we, we sit there and we obsess over the strangest things. And yet God clothed the grass and says, look, it's thrown into the furnace. And he uses a word here that was common in baking. You, you, you see, grass is, is arrayed in beauty. And yet it, it's only good for baking. If I were to ask you if you could name the fourth largest manufacturer of women's garments in the United States, I'm pretty sure that none of you would come up with the actual answer. Do you know who it is? It's the Mattel Corporation. And it's Barbie clothes. Seriously, it's the fourth largest. The Mattel Corporation is the fourth largest manufacturer of women's garments in the United States of America on average per year. They, they, they use something on the order of about two and a half million yards of fabric to make Barbie doll clothes. Loopy! You talk about obsessing and you go in there and you buy the little packs and there's like, you know, it's got the shoes and the matching bracelet. And Why do I know this? But you go in there and you look at it and you're like, are you kidding me? It's just as bad for the guys. You go to Bass Pro Shops, yeah, I need the uh, dark camo because, you know, I don't want, you know, if I'm in the shadow a little bit, it's like, it's crazy. We concern ourselves with it. We worry about it. And yet the Lord says, look, the flowers of the field are good for cooking God takes care of them makes them beautiful don't you think that much more he's going to take care of us why do we worry about it and I'll tell you this worry's not a trivial sin it kind of strikes a blow at the heart of God at his integrity a third thing worry is actually unreasonable in light of our faith, isn't it? Here's why I say this. Think about this. Worry is unreasonable in light of your faith. There's not one person in your, if you're going to heaven, you are going to heaven because you have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, right? So does it make any sense to you that you should trust God with your eternity, but not trust Him with bread? That you would trust Him with your salvation, 
but not trust him with your clothes. That you should trust him that you're saved by grace and through faith, that not of yourself, it isn't of works. You can't boast about it. You should trust him with that, but you should really start to worry about whether you're going to have clean water to drink. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? So if we're naming Jesus Christ as Lord, probably should stop worrying about some of these things because it strikes at the heart of God. It's unreasonable. That's why we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. And it's interesting because he kind of chides a little bit here. The Gentiles, it literally means peoples or multitudes. It's ethnoi in the original language. It means that people who don't know the Lord, they are concerned about these things all the time. Worrying about what they'll eat, drink. Worrying about the toys they're going to, whatever. They're, they're obsessed with materialism, as well they should be. They should be. People without Jesus should be concerned about those things, but not somebody who knows the Lord. Because we're trusting him with eternity. When you say Jesus is Lord, you're saying, I trust him with my eternity. And so, you're not okay trusting him for 70, 80, maybe 90. If God doesn't like you 100 years, the only reason he'd leave you here for 100 years is if he doesn't want you in heaven. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. But, but you get the point? You, you need to worry for 100 years, but you're okay with the next trillion and giving him that. It's silly. And that's the fourth point. Worry ultimately is actually silly in light of eternity. Even if all those things were actually taken away from you, if, as we saw this morning, if it was your last day on this earth and it actually, you know, you starved to death, you died of thirst, you, you know, you were unclothed and you froze to death, even if that happened, you still have an eternity in the fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. So not only are we thinking about entertaining something that, that questions God's character, questions God, God's love for us, questions whether we have an eternal view or not, but it becomes at some point silly. Nonsensical really is a good way to look at it. And frankly, some people are so committed to worrying that if they can't worry about something in the present, anybody else ever do this? You can't find something to worry about in the present. You worry about the future. Well, yeah, that's a, a, everything's okay today, but it won't be tomorrow. It's silly. And then we occupy our mind and our life. We get all worked up over it. And before you know it, you're just wandering around completely worried. And there's a zero, it's fog. Zero substance to the things that you're worrying about. That's why Jesus says, look, tomorrow will take care of itself. Tomorrow takes care of itself. It's not a careless philosophy. Kind of like the hedonist who just, you know, looks at his own person and says, you know, I'm going to do what pleases me. It's simply saying, look, I trust God. I believe what he said. I know what he said. I can hold him to what he said. And if he said it, he's going to do it. And if he's going to do it, I don't need to worry about it. That's faith. There is enough trouble for each day. So why add trouble on top of trouble? Amen? Trouble's going to come. You're going to have things that you can look at and say, well, that's kind of troubling. You'll have those things. Jesus is actually acknowledging that you're going to have those things. But you don't need to worry about them because everybody has those things. I have those things. You have those things. God gives us sufficient grace for today. You cannot store up God's grace for a future trial. He gives you what you need today. He gives me what I need today. He gives us that grace one day at a time. And, and, and look, we, we'd love to be able to say, well, here's my bucket of grace, and when I get to this thing over here, I can take the grace out of this bucket and apply it to this thing over here, but you don't get to do that. 
Because that takes faith out of the equation. Just like you've got to trust God for today, we need to trust him for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah 26, be of a steadfast mind. It will keep you in perfect peace. It keeps the one in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Christ. Amen? Focused on heavenly things. Leaves God who he is. It, it, we have to remember who God is. We have to trust in that love that he has for us. We have to make sure we're not being unreasonable because God is able. And we have to exercise that faith and we need to remember not to think silly things about a loving God. And so Jesus says, to sum it all up, don't worry. I've got it covered. I know what you need. And because of who I am, because I love you, because you're my kids, I'll take care of that. You go about doing the things you can do. If you got a job, work hard. If you have a house, take care of it. If you got a car, put gas in it. You know, those are simple things. But worrying about whether the car is going to last another two weeks, three weeks, ten months, not going to make the car last longer. Worrying about whether you're going to have groceries next year, not going to put groceries in the cabinet. So Jesus says, don't do it. Trust me with it. You know the crazy thing? 100% he's going to be trustworthy. You're not ever going to wake, well, you know, I trusted God and he let me down. It won't happen, ever. It won't ever happen. Because he's God and he loves you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you the promises that you give us in your word. Lord Jesus, thank you that as you spoke these words to the disciples, to that crowd gathered there on the mount, Lord, as they were looking out at the Sea of Galilee, Lord, we don't know what was going on. Maybe some birds circling over the lake. Perhaps the wind sweeping down from Mount Hermon. God, but we know that from that day to this, you've always been faithful. And you have loved us with an undying love. It's a reason that you, Jesus, came to this earth, was to express that love. You didn't have to, but you loved us. And you love us to the uttermost. And so, Lord, help us to walk in faith. And we ask that you would keep us from worry. Lord, when we are tempted to worry, would you cause us to remember your goodness, your care for us, your majestic promises. Or would you keep us from thinking silly things, Lord, that question your integrity and your character? Lord, thank you that all of these things, we can say without faith it's impossible to please you. And so, God, we just give you our lives and all of our concerns. Pray that you would just help us to rest and trust that you, the God who loves us, is more than able to meet every need that we have. And your word says you will. So we bless you. We praise you. We thank you. We ask all this in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.